Welcome to Occupy Radio. This is your host, Mike McCabe. Uh, and to celebrate Labor Day, I thought we should come up with some labor issues. And that's when I thought of my old friend, Dermot Myrie. And uh, Myrie uh, has a guest with us tonight, Ali Anderson, you said? Aridopoulos. Oh, Aridopoulos. And um, we, uh, we have some things to talk about regarding uh, teachers in New York City. So um, last week you had a call for, you had a strike call. Can, yeah. you, can you tell me what prompted that and what's, what's happening now? So I'll just start. Um, welcome, viewers. Um, Myrie from the Movement of Rank and File Educators. We are part of the UFT, the Social Justice Caucus. Um, so last week, um, two weeks ago um, on a Friday, um, President Michael Mugro came out with the idea that uh, we should have a strike based on a 50 point plan of safety items that weren't in school. Um, so coming out of that, he, he tried to mobilize folks where if these items weren't in school, whether we have PPE or we have a BRT team in place, a COVID response team, nurses and so on, these are some of the items on it, then um, schools would be closed and we would threaten the mayor with that. So that was that for now in a brief summary. Ali, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, um, and I'll just add the nature of the vote was changed the day of um, the vote. So Michael Mogru spoke to the mayor. They made an agreement um, based on the three demands that the UFT had presented. We did not, we were not able to see any of the agreement in writing before voting on it. We did not have any time to take that back and discuss with our chapters. So it was really um, an undemocratic vote. Uh, this apparently is something that's going on with quite a number of uh, union leaders across the country in various industries. What, uh, what are you planning on doing as a, uh, as a union with leaders that act on their own? So first thing I'll just say here that we in the caucus, we reject both the substance of the agreement that the UFD leadership made with the mayor as the process, uh, including the lack of transparency and, and um, the non-inclusion of rank and file members that produce this so-called deal. Michael Mogro mailed this deal arrangement directly with the mayor, as my comrade Ali just said, and with other union leaders. We know who they are, DC's 37, Henry Garrido, who never stand up for his members. Surprisingly was to see him the other day um, sitting there at the table. And then um, the CSA president, um, Canazario, who was um, going against Mulgrew and then finally I uh, saw all these men in a room um, said they had a deal and um, the rank and file was missing. So, um, so, to, so um, what we have here was no meaningful input from the members, um, the UFT rank and file members, students, families will be most impacted by this agree agreement and deserve to be heard. And we will be con continue uh, to be on this road to be heard. So it's not finished yet. This deal is not finished. Yeah. What were the three items that, uh, that uh, he agreed uh, and uh, de Blasio agreed to? So he would have, uh, the first one was to have um, follow protocols. So um, protocols means um, for your viewers, um, um, the CDC protocols, entering, exiting, um, how do you handle somebody who has COVID, um, temperature checks, all these protocols, including itself the creation of a team called a CRT, a COVID response team, which is a part of the state guidelines, chances regulation, where you have a safety team in each school. So that was it. Added to that was um, supplies, masks, face shields, gloves, hand sanitizers. We'll get into that later with hand sanitizers and also, uh, which is PPE and also supplies. So that was it, yeah. What about filtering systems for the schools then, uh, as far as air conditioning and things like that? Yeah, one of the demands was um, that we have testing available in the building. So the agreement that um, our to with the mayor was that they would do once a month testing, uh, random sampling, percentage a percentage of people being tested would be based on the percentage of people in 
or the total number, excuse me, of people in the building. So for mm -hmm. example, 10%, 20% based on how big uh, the school community is happening once a month starting in October. So this is really not sufficient in no way um, is this an agreement that any scientist uh, would, <laughs> would um, advocate sure. for. Sure. Um, yeah, and that's a good wake up mm -hmm. call for me, Ali, because you got me on my toes. So the agreement, it failed to address the health and safety concerns about the mayor's plan from educators. So um, first, um, Mulgrew was shouting, yelling, universal testing or else. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, he just folded, just gave in. So the theatrics. Yeah, um, so that was it. So, so uh, testing won't be universal. And so it will be monthly, as Ali said, and they're gonna have mobile labs outside of schools. I don't know how that's gonna look like and so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Now, when was school supposed to open? They, the mayor pushed it back for two weeks. So the, yeah, the date has been pushed back for students to come into the buildings, but not for teachers. Oh, so you have to start um, at, at the normal time then? Yep, um, we're going in on Tuesday. Um, even though the health and health and safety protocols have not been met yet. Now, will teachers actually show or, or will some stay home? Well, it's a mixed baggage. It depends on uh, some people stay home, have accommodations. So those are the ones who follow the CDC guidelines, who gave them that waiver. If you have certain type of illnesses, hypertension, asthmatic, um, diabetes, hypertension, all those pieces. If you apply for accommodations because comorbidity may exist, if you get infected with COVID. So those people can stay home until December 31st. Um, other people, the in-person doing a the hybrid, they will have to report on September 8th, which is a, a few days away. And um, they will be in the schools, as you know, in the schools that are not yet checked. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into reports as to why this deal is a failed deal. It's dead on arrival. Um, why people are so anxious, depressed right now, going back on September 8th um, to unsafe buildings, some buildings, and they will be there until September 18th, having that 10 day period in buildings to have these conditions fixed. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm just giving you the dates as we speak. So students will come in on the 21st. Now, some of the things that pop up in the newspapers or online about uh, people able to go to the mall, so why can't kids go to school? And part of that, I think, is because of the enclosure. You're all stuck together in those small classrooms. Um, but what else is, what else is uh, on your agenda that I wouldn't think of or the, re the listeners wouldn't, wouldn't uh, think of first? Yes, so there's a lawsuit um, by the restaurant owners. Um, I think they're suing the Blasio for $2 billion for loss of service, uh, for not having in indoor dining. So uh, maybe he's buckling to um, Wall Street and ignoring Main, uh, Main Street. So, so it's just about opening up the economy because it's unsafe. There are so many things now at stake. Um, transit, um, uh, we're gonna have cuts um, from the governor on October 1st. You know, he has this rolling budget that he's mm -hmm. gonna cut as he like. So that's gonna be an issue. So there's a lot of coalition um, groups that's, uh, that's, that's getting coalesced. Coalition groups are coalescing uh, to let it be known and let it be heard clear that what we're going back into is going to be affecting black and brown folks the most right. uh, who were impacted prior in, in March. And it's going to happen again if there's an uptick um, deaths of black and brown folks. Yeah. Ali, you were going to say something? Yeah, I'll just add to what Myri said. Um, and just to address sort of those comparisons, because I've seen those too. And I think they're really uh, short-sighted, right? Um, a lot of these school buildings in New York City were built literally a hundred years ago. Uh, they were built during the Great Depression or they were updated during the Great Depression through a jobs program that the government funded, the WAP. Mm -hmm. um, so during a time of economic crisis, much like we have now, instead of uh, using austerity measures, instead of starving the economy, the government decided to fund people, right? They decided to fund jobs and that's how a lot of these school buildings got built. They're beautiful, 
world, they're, they're amazing buildings, but they're incredibly old and they don't have ventilation. For example, my school does not have a ventilation system, right? So these comparisons, oh, the malls are open, they're, they're really short-sighted and they don't understand the context that we work in every day. Mm -hmm. My classroom already has asbestos, right? I've already had the ceiling fall in while I've been teaching. I've already ha found dead rats in the classroom. And everybody I talk to has a story like this. You know, these are not unique experiences whatsoever. So, you know, I'm not a health expert. You know, we have, we have our, we have many creative ideas and solutions about what, you know, safe schools can look like, but the truth is we don't have trust. Trust hasn't been rebuilt and that's been historically an issue in New York City public schools. And it's also been an issue because of mayoral control, because like Myrie said, there's no rank and file um, input in our union and there's no rank and file input in the DOE. It's a draconian to a tyrannical system. Which leads me back to my question about the leadership of the union. How hard are you going to press to have those leaders changed or to get them to change their, their minds? Well, the revolution will not be televised, so it's, it's real. Uh, okay. Okay. mentally uh, so they experience it like they will experience his life and death so people going back into buildings we're letting them know we do not have nurses yet right. the, pre the president says okay if you don't have a nurse call a hotline and the school will be closed folks who are watching we'll see what happens when we call that hotline it's yeah. going to be the same old dancing with the stars wait a minute we got to fix it we're going to get a nurse and you're going to have people still in that building and so on do we have ppe maybe we will have um, do we, uh, we check the ventilation, which is the most important aspect? Nobody. The UFT um, came out with the a language, and I think it has legalese in it. Uh, anytime you hear the word intent, if you read down Mike on the document. Yeah, of course, intent, they, they always cover themselves. Yeah. All right. Uh, the, the intent here is not to clarify the air quality in a building, but to see if we ask two questions. Are there windows? or is there centralized air? So right mm -hmm. away, we're not asking about the air quality, air flow, uh, um, the air quality, the amount of oxygen that's in the building, CO2 or whatever is there. Um, they're not doing that. They just want to make sure if there's windows. So that's not checking the ventilation system to see if filters were put in. It would be simple. When were the MERV 13 um, filters put in? October 3rd. Okay, show us the receipt. We're good. Mm -hmm. um, but there's nothing like that. A few guys said they're experts, use these pseudonyms, experts, independent experts, 100 guys who were trained, no scientific background, people like you and I um, with college degrees walking around to say, this is good or this is not good. On my report, Mike, which came out Thursday evening, um, Friday evening, um, a day after they said they were going to release it, um, there were so many unsures on it. So if there's so many uncertainties, unsure it is, if that's a word, um, well, uh, we won't be open um, according to what the UFT said, right? So we'll just call the hot line. Mm -hmm. What about the numbers for the schools throughout the country that have, have students go back and there's been a rise in COVID? Well, how is that being addressed? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's not being talked about. Uh, it's not being addressed. And I think this is really a great um, sort of case study of like the white man's burden. Um, Mayor de Blasio keeps that he has kept on this rhetoric that this is for working families, this is for black brown communities. And it is just so false. The data shows, right. like Myri mentioned, the comorbidities are more common in income black community mm -hmm. so they will again be the most impacted by covid um not to mention his plan does nothing to alleviate um scheduling concerns for working families so you know he's so he's so blinded by that complex um and it's just yeah that's what we're watching right now it's, it's a total denial of reality and just about him and his ego yeah, yeah. particularly from someone who served on the uh, school board commission uh what was it, 20 years ago, maybe? Yeah. You, and you said, would think he would know better. He said he would send his child in. So, and just to piggyback off what Alice said, uh, Mike, uh, we are part of a coalition called the New York City School Workers Solidarity Campaign. New York City School Workers Solidarity Campaign. We're a group of um, city workers and community organizations 
um, including members of the New York State Nurses Association. And one of um, um, the Nurses Association, they came up with a statement that um, the city currently does not have the testing and tracing capacity to effectively identify and contain new outbreaks. So, and with $1 billion being robbed from city workers right. in, the, in, in the budget, um, they say this is not gonna happen if there's an uptick. So the nurses are saying it, experts are saying it. They do have their experts because as you know, it's science, you can always have two sides talking and mm -hmm. uh, but you're just reading the facts and knowing what's there. So Mulgo came out with somebody from Harvard and there's also another person from Harvard that came out recently and said, that's not the way to go opening schools like this. So, so it's the competing views, but, um, but, the, but the, the gist of the matter is Mike, Parents are saying they're not going in. Students, even the high school students yep. are saying they're not. Educators are saying that they're not feeling safe. Politicians are saying it. Electeds are saying it. Mm -hmm. Scientists are saying it. So who should we listen? So we know what they're, they're listening to, to Wall Street to open it up. I don't know if you ever traveled on the subway recently. Oh, I've yeah, been traveling just, on the subway all summer. Just the other I day, I think. On a seat with three people. Yesterday I was on it. Now you have six people now sitting on a seat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the bus, the buses are in worse shape. Yeah. Uh, at least they're in, in Red Hook. They're quite crowded. Yes. Yeah. So New York City, get ready for, for this. What's going to happen here shortly? Yeah. Which which leads to another question. Aside from yeah. uh, the COVID situation, is uh, the mayor's uh, budget situation where he's talking about reducing employees by tw twenty two thousand employees. Uh, yeah. Are uh, there numbers being being banted around for teachers? Yes, we have 9,000, um, uh, some numbers floating around, but Ali, you want to elaborate? And we already are experiencing a hiring freeze of counselors and teachers. Uh, we are going back into the schools with more cops than counselors at a time of mass grieving, at a time of extreme need for counselors. There's still a high freeze. Incredible. Yeah, I, I had heard that. Yeah. Actually, not, not long ago from other sources. Um, and nurses are going to be let go too. Um, so just imagine from the hospitals, um, educators, and, um, and, and with the funding, the NYPD within schools, uh, we know that was a lie. Um, that was just, um, you know. They were just shifting them. people, weren't they? Right. Yeah. They well, shifted it to... Go, go. DOE. And we don't even know if that shifted because the chancellor is saying no, they're going to have mask enforcement. So students got to be removed. I don't know if teachers can remove students because we're not allowed to touch students. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who's going to remove students. That's a word that's, you know, that verb remove students. <laughs> it seems like it's some security uh, police apparatus is going to do that. No. Definitely. And that's um, actually a point in our health justice agenda that uh, we cannot use health protocols to criminalize students because we know that that will only perpetuate the disparity of uh, the school to prison pipeline. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is a totally different subject that we could probably spend two days on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But is, there, is there something else that, that uh, we should talk about? Yes. Um, so we, let's go back into the operations of the union. Um, because um, people may not understand as to what's happening. So um, the way it was presented, um, um, a couple of white guys sitting and making decisions and just ignoring um, the communities uh, that's been impacted. Um, there was no input from parents. Um, they came up with the survey, which didn't give people a choice. So that was the first thing. There was no language translation services. Then they, the DOE, we asked, our caucus asked for parents to be surveyed. Then we asked again for us to be surveyed. We haven't heard any results, Mike, of those survey. So the DOE surveyed us, do you wanna go back to school, all of that stuff, how safe do no. you feel? We haven't heard that. So to bring it back, so with all these things that are out there and everybody's saying parents want to go back, but you didn't even have an input from another stakeholders. That we know we got to work. We're ready to work, but we want to say full remote. Mm -hmm. um, but so what the union did and to center it again as to what I need the um, audience to understand is that it was so undemocratic. We didn't hear about all these deals. They, um, um, the UFT wasn't fighting 
for anything, for school safety, anything. All summer we've been out. You see us um, re-emphasizing, reiterating how uh, drastic it's going to be, how it's going to affect the city. We haven't seen the UFT till two Fridays ago. They came out with the stage show, NAACP, Hazel Dukes. I could talk about it. Um, Hazel Dukes came out. I haven't seen her either because all summer uh, she was quarantined herself, and I respect Hazel. Uh, but she came out with Mulgrew on that show. Yes, Brother Mulgrew, this is a plan. And um, I don't know what plan was it because there was nothing that addressed black issues, brown issues. He had somebody from the Asian caucus there talking. And so again, ignoring the rank and file. So again, he have all talking points. He, ha he had RW there, Randy Weingarten speaking from Washington and everybody, not one teacher was on that press conference. Uh -huh when he released this. So I just want to know about how undemocratic this is. Now it gets worse. Yes. So after he saw what we were doing with the caucus, and Ali, you could pick it up from there. I don't want to take it away. Go ahead. No, I just want to just, I want to hear what you're going to say about that. I just want to add, not only were the rank and file been ignored, but families and students have been ignored through this process as well. The initial demands that the UFT made were only about the school during a pandemic during an economic crisis, during a housing crisis, when our families are on the verge of eviction, when they've been cut off of SNAP mm -hmm. benefits, how dare we perpetuate the historic divide between the teachers and the parents? This is a moment for us to come together and to realize that we all have the same needs and that's to keep us safe and to have our basic necessities met. And instead of extending that hand to the communities, the UFT just did what they always do, which is ignore the rights of the community. Sorry, Myri, go ahead. It's good. And uh, Mike, and as members of the Green Party, um, you know, again, we're going to point fingers now at Governor Como. Um, he didn't want to say anything about his body Como. So because we know what the word was being spread already, tax the ultra rich. Right. He won't that's, tax. So they he won't, won't tax do. it. So right. how are you going to fund education? And right. as you know, Mike, we've been down in the trenches for years. All Democratic governors have owed New York City schools money from that CFP. Te teachers, have, teachers have been buying supplies for kids. We, we know that. The public knows about it. So right. when are they going to respond? So they're not in, intending on responding. So what they did was just um, do it best. So you have some minds that sat down. And this has to be not just coming from them. There's a whole apparatus coming from Washington with Randy Weingarten because she's trying to get into the cabinet of Uncle Joe. But I've told Uncle Joe already, I've sent him an email. I said, you better not put Randy Weingarten in the cabinet. <laughs> uh, you better not put her there because she does not understand what education is. She's a lawyer. She's an attorney. Yeah. She doesn't understand what education is. So to bring it back, Mike, so uh, we have all these inequities that weren't addressed. Broadband, we knew that the remote learning in, in the, in, um, earlier on in the spring wasn't all that great. We look at the other big districts in New York um, State, Buffalo, Yonkers, Rochester, and Syracuse, they all went away to remote. But we are this great experiment that's going out there to say, let's open it up and so on and so forth. And instead of taxing the rich with Rob Jackson's um, Senate Bill 7378 and Rosenthal's Assembly Bill 10363, um, nobody's up to that. But uh, he was there running the Heroes Act, the Heroes Act for a teacher and for a, a, a union leader who's talking about the Heroes mm -hmm. Act. He doesn't understand it got to pass through the Senate, mm -hmm. a Republican led majority Senate. And you hear this guy here who lives in the White House saying he's going to defund New York City. Yeah, he's going to do it to all, all the Democratic states. But, you know, yeah. just, just look at what's happening all across the country in different issues. Look at the number of people, that the potential number of people that are going to be homeless. Ali, you mentioned it a little while ago. I mean, there are already 24,000 kids going to school from shelters every day. You go through this, through the pandemic, that number will rise another 25 to 30,000. And the government, the, the federal government is the only one that can solve it because the city and state are unable to print money. They can't cancel contracts because it's not possible. It won't, won't happen. So that means the federal government has to come along and pay all these rents or at least set something up to help these people. But everyone just kicks it down the road. 
Yes. So, and so that's a good segue, uh, Mike. We don't know. Uh, Chancellor Carranza says if there's a 20% cut, it's dead on arrival. Everybody's going full remote. And that's why we're asking now, more than traumatizing the students, traumatizing the parents, instead of them having to shift their biological clock to work things around, why not just go full remote now and just brace up for that October 1st cut and then we'll be fully remote. Uh, but everybody's just dancing to see what's gonna happen, some magic. Wouldn't it have made, have made more sense to have New York City go remote and then test your little patterns uh, in the smaller cities and smaller towns than to pick the biggest area where people could be infected? Totally. And think about all the money and time that has been squandered when we could have been training to make remote learning better. We could have been galvanizing right. resources to make remote learning better. We wasted all this time on hygiene theater. You know, it doesn't matter how many Clorox wipes or plexiglass we have. If we don't have free flowing air in the rooms, if the air quality is bad, we're going to get the virus. You know? and, what, and what about Bill Matt Gates? What, what was this I had heard earlier about uh, de Blasio bringing Bill Gates into New York City? What the hell was that? Oh, you, you wanted Gia here, but Ali, you want to address it? <laughs> well, no, you go ahead, Mary. Okay, so, yeah, so, so we know what's happening, uh, Mike, as, as Green Party members. This is called disaster capitalism. So Bill Gates is going to come now and just exactly. uh, er eradicate teachers from classrooms. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're going to be setting up modules and laptops give to students with modules so, so you'll have programmers out there yeah. and an occasional teacher in a good yes. position, position teaching yeah. thousands of kids yes yeah. so we want to make sure that we are here to teach uh we they just need to get these buildings right and um they can do the right equipment if bill gates wants something to do he needs to lay down broadband in new york city right all right, mm -hmm. <laughs> all these right. entities that are there running around playing games, Spectrum and all these clown companies, um, let Bill Gates come in, give him a part of it, uh, don't let it be monopolized, uh, and let him lay some broadband down, some real stuff, and, and give it um, to students, and give him a tax break then. Mm -hmm. so yeah, this is definitely like the mass privatization of education, the remote version, right? The online version. Um, this is just, you know, the classic solution um, that capitalism finds when there's a problem with the public sector, take it over with the private sector. Right. So right. that'll yeah. be ne that'll be next year when De Blasio gives out schools. There'll be General Electric School. There'll be uh, Trump School over here. Uh, yeah, Best the sponsor of school. Right. Best Buy School. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Target school, yeah. But you, you know yeah. where he always go, Mike? They end up at CUNY teaching um, night classes um, because I don't know where else he's going to go. Um, I don't know in, in Biden's place. But right now with education, um, he hasn't done what he's supposed to do for black and brown families. Um, it's not there right now. Right now he's sending us back into a debt trap spiral with this, uh, with this virus. I, I can't remember any, even going back before I was born, I can't remember any mayor so hated as he is from all sides. Yeah, and it's getting worse by the day. And I wish, you know, um, I don't know. Um, there's so many candidates coming up. Mike, why won't you run next now, year? There, there are people that are activists and then there are politicians. <laughs> I, I'm not the politician. I know, I know you're not, you're not <laughs> dealing, dealing and telling lies and so on. I know you don't do that. Yeah. So what about you? Um, yes, um, I, I wanted was to do a city council gig, but um, <laughs> you know, because that all, of them, the, are all yeah. of them are leaving, so, but no, I, I withdrew. Yeah. yeah, that was the thing that, I, that I've been talking to the Brooklyn Greens about. I mean, and I talked to Howie about it at a fundraiser that we had for Howie. I said, Howie, this is more important than even your race, is for New York City to put as many Greens on the city council as possible. Um, yeah, we need third party. Uh, we saw what Coma did. Uh, he tried to do it with the third parties tried to get rid of us, he wasn't successful. He went even worse than that. You see, he was trying to take away the primaries. Yes. For uh, his own party, can mm -hmm. you imagine? Mm -hmm. 
and everybody. So that's why Democrats, I love you all, but I am tired of the Democrat person. I'm, I'm one of those. I'm a Green Party member. Um, yeah. So the, this is going to be a very interesting election mm -hmm. because that's I don't. Tired. Yeah, I, I don't know if people just won't vote, or they'll change and vote Green Party. I'm hoping for that, but there may may be a record low for this election. Because those of us that look at the politicians know there's very little difference between the two. I mean, Biden has been nothing but a right-wing Democrat for 47 years. He's talked about uh, putting Social Security on the table to negotiate. Uh, Trump wants to cut uh, the taxes to uh, Social Security. They're, they're alike. There's so many things that you can connect them with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what they need to look at, Mike, is the health care. They really need a robust health system, family members. I was just reading research about the athletes that are having heart problems when after the positive COVIDs, yeah. and it's affecting children as well. Mm -hmm. And I can't just imagine 30 years from now when they start going into the social security lockbox, taking stuff out to deal with this health. Well, there is no lockbox. <laughs> Nixon did, did that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They just put it into the general fund. Yeah. So, so, so we don't know what's going to happen, but uh, we're going to be preparing for a health care um, crisis um, for these young students that we're fighting for. That's why we're fighting now, because we know 10 years from now, we're going to have so many heart problems, respiratory problems, cardiac problems. Mm -hmm. We're going to need so m many. Um, ventilators and all this stuff. We don't know how we're going to manage, but it's going to be that way. It's going to be these diseases that affects the circulatory system and the res respiratory system. I was just going to connect it back to the um, the point about the union leadership. You know, like the, the UFT is really um, acting as a professional organization, not as a union in the true sense of the term. Mm -hmm. You know, the union is to fight for workers' rights of all workers, um, and they really neglected. They had a huge opportunity here to uh, build solidarity with other workers in the face of this pandemic, in the face of the housing crisis, and they just pivoted to be selfish um, as usual. So, yeah. you know, this was really a moment for a general strike against austerity, for um, for for life, to fight for life. And uh, they, they definitely fumbled, you know, purposefully, intentionally, I would say, you know. Well, at, uh, Mari, we, we have a friend, John, from the Chinese Workers Club, and th those people were fighting hard for the sweat bill. And how, how could their union just request $200 for them when most of them were owed thousands of dollars? That is just incredible. Now, that's a big union. It's eleven ninety nine. They should have been dictating how much money that they got, and not minuscule two hundred dollars. Yes, and we've been out in the trenches, and you've been out there for fighting for these poor folks. Well, let's hope. Hopefully, we'll continue doing that. Yes. So all these unions need to be changed. And uh, you see what our sister caucuses are doing, UTLA, Chicago, Baltimore, all these unions here are making changes on a social justice, anti-racist um, 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 line where, you know, they're talking about the communities that they're in. It's not just getting a few dollars, uh, but making sure that the students who they serve in their communities are respected and they have the resources. We live in the United States of America, for God's sake. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, like union leadership should definitely watch out because you know these our health justice working group meetings started with about five people every week, and now we're up to a hundred people every week. We just had a thousand people on our general call. There were more registered than that. We had three hundred people registered on our last call. So you know, it's more is coming for the union leadership. That's that's for that, sure. That's great to hear. I, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know Mike wants that long time rank and yeah. file. He's tired of this corporate stuff. <laughs> Hey, great. Yeah. But one of, one of the things that came out of the pandemic, though, was mutual aid. And I, I think that yep. we have to build on what mutual aid really is. Uh, you know, delivering food is one thing. Uh, maybe helping mothers, uh, single mothers, watch their kids. You know, we have to expand on those things to help each other because government is just not doing it. They will not. Yeah. 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 So uh, I want to thank the two of you for 
coming on tonight and uh, uh, I'll make sure that I get this out as much as I can. Uh, do you have an event tomorrow? We're going to be calling. Um, we'll be on social media. media. We'll be yeah. calling, yep. Okay. We'll be calling these politicians and, and so on and so forth. Right. And uh, yeah, there'll be there'll be individualized local district actions, uh, hopefully on Tuesday. But you know, yeah, we'll see. Okay. Well, I have a friend up the street, a neighbor up the street. I'll make sure he sees this video. And uh, I, I forget what school he teaches in. It's locally here in Red Hook. So uh, we'll get him on your side. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you for everything, Alice. Thank you, Mike. Right. Appreciate so it. So Thank you. All right. Thank have you, a good Mike. Night. Right. Bye -bye. Thanks.